Um, uh, thank you all. Um, seeing as it's now six thirty, I think we should uh, make make a start with this webinar. Um, in the interest of time, uh, I think we just start off with some quick introductions. My name is uh, Modi Kating. I'm one of the orthopedic consultants working at Aga Khan, moderating this session. Um, this is uh, a session that we're going to be looking at uh, trauma in the knee uh, and some aspects of management, uh, mainly angled towards the residents. But of course, uh, in the interest of continuous learning, we're all going to pick something up from this. Um, uh, I'd like to just extend uh, gratitude to uh, KOA for all these uh, ongoing webinars they have on uh, uh, various topics allowing us to keep our education up to date and uh, particularly want to also thank uh, Sun Pharma in this uh, instance for being a sponsor. Now our speaker for the day will be taking us through uh, assessment and management of common knee conditions is uh, Mr. Baraza. Uh, Mr. Baraza is a friend and colleague who worked together at uh, Aga Khan uh, University Hospital. Uh, he's a Fellowship trained uh, surgeon in uh, both sports injuries and pediatric uh, uh, orthopedics. And uh, he'll be taking us through this knee session and giving us perspective from both worlds, including the adult, uh, the adult knee. Um, I think without further ado, I'll hand over to Mr. Baraza. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Tsinga, for the introduction. I'll share my screen. Is it visible to all? Yes, we can see it. Yeah, we're seeing so, that. Okay. So the point of this talk is to take us all through the knee, particularly for the first line clinicians. It doesn't have to be a junior doctor, but if you are the first person to see a patient who comes in with knee pathology, this talk might be relevant. And of course, as Mr. Tinger mentioned, in the interests of continuous uh, medical education. I also hope to learn from uh, from the from the clinicians who are attending. So hopefully at the end, we'll have some questions and insights and opinions on some of the more controversial topics I've raised. Uh, so the first thing is to know all the common conditions. I like to stratify it according to age. So in children, they're more likely to get septic joints because of the arrangement of the blood vessels around the metaphysis or transit synovitis after a, an illness such as a flu, patella instability in the slightly older child, as well as a discoid meniscus, <clears throat> which usually presents as a knee which uh, has mechanical symptoms in a young child between the ages of four and eight. In the teenager, it's more ligamentous and sports injuries, including osteochondral lesions. And in the adults, chondromalacial, pat chondromalacial patella and degenerative changes tend to predominate. But always at the back of our minds, we should be thinking about the life-threatening things. So tumors, infections, and then also the very common conditions that cut across all ages. So bursitis in elderly, uh, particularly ladies, gout, uh, sorry, rheumatoid arthritis, and in middle-aged men, gout, for we do like our, our nyamachoma and our tuskers. So it always starts with a history. 
all good medicine starts with a good history. So Socrates, the site, onset character, radiation, associated features, the timing, what makes it better, worse, and how severe it is. Now, when a patient comes with any kind of complaint, it's really important to double down on what's exactly happened. So when they say twisted during football, you want to know, all right, how exactly it happened? How did you twist it? What direction did your leg go? Were you able to finish the game? Were you able to walk off the pitch or do you have to be carried? And what has happened since then? Did it swell? Did it feel unstable? Were you able to move it? And from that uh, incident history, it can point you towards two or three possible diagnoses, really narrowing down the, uh, the, the, the possible reasons that the patient might be presenting. And then also for the more elective conditions, you want to rule out any associated features such as a fever, whether they're getting pain at night, whether it's relentless, especially at rest, and then the rest of the history, past medical history, social history. We want to find out whether the patient is um, is a premiership football player where you'll treat them differently than somebody who just does occasional walking um, once a week. And then next is the examination. It's not... Everyone has their own style of examination, and I think it's important that you master your own style. For the juniors listening, your perceptors or your, your bosses might want you to do the examination a certain way, and of course it's recommended that you follow that, but it's important that you hone your own technique. So my way is assess the gait as they're walking in, and then look, feel, move move special tests and finish with a neurovascular exam. And it's all done in a systematic manner, so nothing is missed. So in the gait, I'm actually trying to question myself. Do they have a short leg gait? Is it antalgic? Is there anything off about it? Is it asymmetrical? And then even when I'm looking, it's systematic from the skin. I'm looking for scars, sinuses, any, um, any stigmata of recent trauma, and then in the soft tissues, any swellings, lumps, effusion, and then in the bones, mainly for the alignment. And so if you do everything systematically, you're unlikely to miss. And then after moving the knees to special tests, which is mainly stability. So you've got your varus valgus stress at 30 degrees to relax the posterior capsule. And then a posterior sag or quads active test, anterior draw Lachman's pivot shift to test for ACL, then dial test at 30 and 90 degrees to check for postrolateral corner and, and posterior cruciate ligament, and then move on to the meniscus, joint line palpation for tenderness, McMurray's test, and patella. So we're looking for the tracking, J sign, apprehension at 30 degrees. And um, at this point, I should say that if the patient comes in with a hot knee, so that's a knee that is being acutely injured, so you're seeing it for the first time hours or maybe a day or two after injury, it's almost impossible to do this comprehensive exam. So what I do, and I think many other surgeons would agree with me, is that you rule out the um, you rule out the important the, the, you rule out a fracture. If you rule out a fracture, you then you can then relax because the rest of the things can be dealt with electively. So X-ray to rule out a fracture, and thereafter it's the usual it's the usual treatment. I think I have it in a subsequent slide oh yeah so after the examination i'm getting a bit ahead of myself we move on to investigations we have a plethora of investigations available to us and it's important that we um that we use them ju judiciously because they are they are or they can be expensive so we want to make sure that we apply them appropriately so uh i, I hope we're all horrified at the afrocentesis technique being employed at the bottom right screen i, I don't think that's how uh that's how we we uh Aspirate joints in Kenya, but uh, there we go. It's for representational purposes only. <clears throat> so moving on to uh, trauma. So like I was saying, in the patient who's injured the knee, we need to, uh, we need an X-ray to rule out a fracture. Once we've done that, it's the usual rest, ice, compression, elevation, lots of analgesia, crutches, offer them a brace, bring them to clinic. Now it's, Seeing a patient a day or two after the injury is, to in, in my practice, not as beneficial as seeing them two or three weeks after because the knee is still very swollen, very tender. You can't elicit any signs, and it's quite often a, a wasted uh, a wasted appointment. It's much better if the initial clinician uh, does the basics right, so rules out the fracture, and if there's no if there is a fracture and it's displaced, of course you know, talk to your local orthopedic surgeon as to whether or not 
it needs uh, surgical management. But if it's not a fracture, then the below will help. And thereafter, it's good to see the patient after about 10 days to two weeks so that you can actually examine and determine what the best mode of investigation is. It's very easy to convince a patient who has a severely injured knee to have any one of those investigations, as I showed in the previous slide, but it's not always the best practice. Sometimes it's best to give them painkillers, assess them, and then determine what needs to be done next. Most of the time, and probably over 70% of the time, the knee is calmer. You don't need any expensive investigations. Now, I'll just go through some of the ligamentous injuries because, uh, you know, I do a bit of sports and it's it's fun. The MCL is the most commonly injured ligament in the knee. In the early grades, it's treated by a um, a brace. The, the exact mode of rehabilitation is not agreed on by clinicians. Every place I've worked have a different way of treating it. But what I do is a gradual range of motion. So for the first two weeks, zero to 30, the next two weeks, zero to 60, the next two weeks, zero to 90, and then free range of motion. And by then, by about eight, nine weeks, you can start a bit more aggressive rehab. And typically by two and a half to three months, they're back to their pre-morbid levels of activity. If it's a grade three, uh, severely unstable neon valgus stressing, it's normally associated with concomitant injury. So it's important we rule out ACL and, and medial meniscal tears. The ACL, another very commonly injured ligament, is uh, often seen in pivoting sports. So in football, basketball, rugby. And it's interesting because the textbooks say it stops anterior translation of the tibia and I don't think there's any controversy about that but it also says it's a restraint to internal rotation of the leg but most of the injuries we see are uh, happen when the leg externally rotates with regards to the femur so I in my mind it's just it's the secondary function of the ACL in addition to preventing anterior translation is rotation both medial and lateral rotation of the leg and the treatment is dependent upon many factors, uh, mostly the patient's uh, stability at about two months, two to three months post-injury, their, um, their, their age, their level of activity or their sporting aspirations. In the younger population, in the pediatric population, we almost always uh, have to surgically reconstruct them because they do very badly if they don't. By the time they're they're in their mid-20s, they've scuffed up their cartilage, they've got osteochondral lesions, and that's not great. In the middle-aged patient, in, in the professional sporting patients, of course, again, that's that's uh, we almost always reconstruct them. But in the middle-aged to elderly patients, you can have a discussion because if they're willing to give up pivoting sports and they've done enough to build up their fine musculature, particularly the hamstrings, which assist in stability of the knee, then you do not always need to surgically reconstruct it. But they do need to um, to engage in a rehabilitation, closed chain exercise protocol. Next is PCL. This is uh, an uncommonly injured uh, ligament. I don't think I've ever done one independently. It's usually part of a multi-ligament picture, but it's the strongest ligament of the knee arising from the posterior aspect of the tibia and insert it onto the medial aspect of the uh, of the medial femoral condyle. It is a restraint against posterior sag of the tibia. So the tests for it are typically the posterior sag in the quads active test, as well as the uh, dial test at, at 30 and 90 degrees. Um, it's injured typically in high energy trauma. So road traffic accidents, and also in North America, we used to see it in American football players because of the defensemen. Uh, these, the opponents run into their legs and knock them with the shoulder, so they're fairly common in that scenario. Thankfully, they don't always require surgical reconstruction, and a period of rehabilitation, particularly quadriceps strengthening, can provide sufficient stability in the knee. Regarding the lateral collateral ligament, it's part of the postrolateral corner, and there's a fairly intimidating diagram there on the left of the anatomy of the lateral side of the knee, which uh, which is good to know. But thankfully, we only need to concern ourselves with the diagram on the right. So the three main structures, which are the lateral collateral ligaments, the popliteal fibular ligament, and the popliteus tendon, which is reconstructed uh, typically using the Lapra technique. Again, this is normally part of a multi-leg 
ligament knee injury picture. The uh, There's another technique called the Larson where you reconstruct two of the ligaments. You reconstruct the fibular collateral as well as the popliteal fibula, but not the, um, not the popliteus tendon. So in the pediatric knee, important thing is to rule out infection. You know, of course, after trauma, uh, rule out infection. Typically, it will be heralded by a previous infection, such as respiratory or gastrointestinal. So ask for that in the history. And, uh, and any, I'm just trying to move my, one second. The patient has pyrexia, please do take a full history, make sure the observations are taken. And in a patient with uh, knee injury or, or knee pain, in a child with knee pain, always assume it's coming from the hips unless unless proven otherwise. So always get a hip examination and at the slightest suspicion, uh, pelvic x-ray. You'll be amazed at some of the things you'll find. I think it's referred down to the knee because of the paths of the obturator and the uh, and the femoral nerves, but it's interesting because uh, the the same nerves are present in adults, yet you don't get the you don't get the same pattern of uh, referred pain, which is a is a bit of a mystery. And then once you've ruled out the important things, you can refer to clinic. In the case of infection, of course, they need a washout. The sooner the better, because the uh, proteolytic enzymes produced by the bacteria can uh, can destroy cartilage, which in a child is a bit of a disaster. It can also endanger the life of the child in severe cases. So pat patella instability, typically seen in females, young females, in, on examination, be careful doing the patella apprehension test. You don't want to cause the patient pain, but you want to just test and see whether they feel a little bit worried when you move the patella laterally. Also, there might be J tracking, which is due to... Uh, uh, it's due to a uh, an even pull of the quad. So the vastus lateralis is moving the knee a little bit more than the vastus medialis obliquus, which is a smaller muscle. So on the extreme of extension, the patella seems to sublux laterally. It is uh, often seen in the picture of generalized ligamentous laxity. So a baton score would be handy. And the patients are typically have gene valgum, so an increased Q angle with a differential line of anatomical pull and um, pull of the patella tendon, which lends itself to a lateral producing vector, which would make the patella want to sublux. Also a history of uh, subluxation of the patella would, would lead you to this diagnosis. And most of the time it is physiotherapy, lots of VMO strengthening exercises. And if that doesn't work, then depending on the MRI parameters, they may require tibial tubercle transfer, such as a focus on osteotomy. And uh, it's often done together with a medial patellofemoral ligament reconstruction, which is done not to hold it in place, but just as a check rein. So it's it's done loose intraoperatively, but the minute the patella starts to sublux on the lateral side, it should be sufficiently tight to prevent it. Uh, the teenage knee, these are just some of the conditions. Uh, Osgood Schlatter's or tibial tubercle traction of apophysitis, very common in the sporty children. Uh, bursitis is common. Uh, osteochondral lesions are, and this is just a diagram of one of the techniques, an OATS technique. It's actually quite successful in young children. So in children and teenagers, it's extremely successful, possibly due to their pluripotency and the regeneration capacity. In adults, uh, you know, it does work, but I think the, re the results are a lot more variable. Chondromalacia patella is probably one of the most common conditions. I think since COVID, very many people, while they were locked up in their houses, decided to take up exercises. And these were people who may have been a little bit above their ideal body weight and hadn't done exercises for quite some time. So the patella, the the, the cartilage around the patella and the subchondral bone gets a little bit stressed and it causes pain. It might also be due to maltracking of the patella, causing lateral wear, and there's often crepitus in the knee. It's important that uh, we maximize non-surgical means of treatment. So I, I'm big on working on the weight. Reduce your weight because the patella takes about two to three times the body weight in joint reaction force with every step. And when you're running or going upstairs, that can increase to up to five times. So it's so important that you come down to your ideal body weight, work on the quads, the VMO, but 
If that doesn't work uh, uh, together with analgesia, then we can um, investigate it further with an MRI to confirm injections and sometimes chondroblasty surgeries is required. Osteoarthritis is often seen in the elderly. It's straightforward. It's typically a patient in after the fifth decade of life who comes in with pain, uh, particularly at night and on walking. It's been getting worse. There's creptus in the knee, a bit of deformity, and it's usually the medial aspect of the knee that gets uh, that gets clobbered. X-rays are as shown, and uh, and again, stepwise approach weight loss, analgesia, if that doesn't help, injections may help for some time, especially if they're not yet decided upon surgery. But ultimately, if the pain um, does not uh, does not subside despite the above measures, then a total knee replacement is required. Other conditions that we need to keep in mind in the middle age, gout typically starts in the hallux, that's the position of uh, uric acid crystals it's a it's thought to be a lifestyle disease so dehydration alcohol plenty of um, purines like meat cells can cause it it is uh it is often settled by NSAIDs and colchicine and it's treated medically mm. using feboxstat or or, or allopurinol. but in the acute setting in a patient with an extremely painful knee which is refractory to to analgesia and anti-inflammatories, then a washout can be beneficial and this can be discussed with the patient. It's important though to stress that uh, the lifestyle must change, otherwise they'll keep getting recurrent episodes and those crystals can really destroy the cartilage, which is not great. Tumor, so always when you're examining, look for lumps. If, if the presentation is not typical and on examination you feel something hard, always ask for lumps other, um, in other parts of the body, uh, ask them about these symptoms. You don't want to miss these, especially in young patients. Osteosarcoma is a young patient's disease. So patients are typically between the ages of 10 and 20, and it's around the knee, most commonly found. Rheumatoid arthritis is uh, commonly found in middle-aged ladies, and it's symmetrical polyarthropathy. But because of the degenerate, it's, it's a disease of the synovium. But in advanced cases, it can start affecting the joint. So you get periarticular erosions and severe pain. So they may present to the uh, orthopedic surgeon. But it's important that they're managed together with their rheumatology colleagues. And of course, bursitis can occur at any age. And it's felt as super official pain all around the knee. These are just a few diagrams as to um, what may be happening. On, on the top left is a swollen knee. That looks quite worrying. And if it feels hard, I'd be suspicious of, of what is shown in the in the picture below. So that's um, osteogenic sarcoma or possibly an earring sarcoma with a bit of soft tissue involvement, moth in eaten appearance, uh, wide, a wide zone of transition. So I'd be concerned about that. Uh, in the middle top is uh, erythematous swollen knee. You'd be suspicious of septic arthritis or gouty arthropathy. And the middle bottom picture is typically how rheumatoid arthritis appears. And on the extreme right, these are all the bursas that are present in the knee. So any one of them could get inflamed. On, on, the, on the medial side, there's also a semimembranosis bursa. But uh, these are the common ones are typically the, uh, the ones around the patella and activity modification, padding while kneeling down if it's if it's occupational related, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, that tends to help. In terms of the Hoffer's fat, fat which is the deep infrapatella fat, uh, if it's refractory to these measures, arthroscopic surgery to debride it is often extremely successful. In conclusion, there are, there are a finite number of conditions in the knee, and once you know them, you know what you're looking for. You can can only you can only find what you're looking for. So it's important that we learn as many of the conditions so that we can narrow a differential diagnosis. It always starts with good history, uh, thorough examination, judicious investigations, and then make sure we we must make sure that we rule out the common things and the life threatening things. So tumor infections, and then also the common things of so the ligament injuries, the fractures. And help is always at hand. If you're not sure what to do, rule out what you think you can and and call a friend. So, or this is just, an, a, it's a picture of an insurmountable amount. This is a, a mountain in uh, in BC, in Canada. Looks insurmountable, but there's always a way around. And with knowledge and help, 
um, almost any challenge can be overcome. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'll be more than happy to field any comments and questions. Thanks for your attention. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Baraza. That was a fantastic talk, given the amount of time you had. You've covered uh, quite a bit. Uh, I think as for the program, the plan is to get uh, the Q&A session after the presentation by Sun uh, Farmer. Um, so for anyone uh, listening, you can either uh, send your question via the chat or uh, wait until we're having the Q&A session afterwards and then we'll go through everything. Um, at this point, I'd like to welcome Stephen Betty, the product manager, uh, Sun Pharma, to just uh, take us through their products and uh, what they're doing uh, both in the country and continent. Uh, thank you. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tinga. And I really want to appreciate Dr. Baraza for the good talk he has given and KOA for accepting us to partner with them in this activity. So I'm going to take through you a short presentation about our company and some of the products we have for your use. And uh, then we shall be able to get to the Q&A. So as Dr. Uh, Atinga mentioned, my name is Steven Bidi. I work in marketing. And looking at Sun Pharma at a glance, uh, I'm sure some of you are familiar with our company, but to them who are not familiar, uh, Sun Pharma is one of the largest generics company in the world. We actually the fourth largest global generic company, uh, which tells you about the stature and the size of the company uh, that we have. And uh, we are ranked 11 in the US market, uh, which is critical because the Americans are known to be very rigorous in their quality standards. And uh, that speaks to the quality of the products we bring to the country and the quality of the products that patients eventually get to uh, use for their many indications. Uh, our home office is India. That is where the company was founded. And out of the 40,000 companies uh, registered in India, Sun Pharma is proud to be the biggest. And just to contrast that, uh, in Kenya, we have about uh, 1,000 to 1,500 pharma companies registered. But in India, we have about 40,000, out of which Sun Pharma stands tall as the best and the biggest amongst them. Uh, when you look at uh, the expanding presence of Sun Pharma in the rest of the world, uh, it tells you that the company is uh, very interested in bringing quality products to our patients uh, right to our doorsteps. Uh, as you can see, we have about 43 manufacturing sites across the world, and we're present in more than 100 countries with uh, about 36,000 global employee base. Uh, our company was founded in 1983 uh, by our founder, and then it started with just two employees and five products. But as you can see from the journey on the slide, we have made strides and big steps along the way, including major acquisitions, in, uh, keynotes um, being uh, run Baxi locally. And uh, we have also acquired other entities in other parts of the world, which has made us to become what we are. Um, Sun is also expanding very rapidly in the emerging markets. And the emerging markets here will refer to the markets outside of the traditional uh, big markets, that is America, Europe, and uh, India, that this will include other countries such as uh, South Sahara, Africa, um, South America, and other parts of uh, Southeast Asia and Eastern Europe. And uh, in those countries, we are proud to have a strong presence. We have about 2,300 representatives, and we also have uh, some manufacturing sites across those countries, including uh, Nigeria and South Africa for, for Africa. So uh, coming to Kenya, we've been in Kenya since 1993. So we recently celebrated uh, 30 years uh, of being present in Kenya. And uh, we have continued to grow and uh, to make uh, great strides in this country by availing products that your patients would use. I'm sure some of you have, or rather most of you have come across some of the brands we have. So for tonight, I just want to focus on uh, a few brands that are relevant to your practice. And one of them is uh, Etode, which is uh, our Etoricoxy. So I'm sure you're all familiar with the molecular Etoricoxy, so I won't go into weeks. But I just want to mention that uh, 
for any patient uh, where you need to manage uh, the pain with an atorecoxib, then uh, I think the first brand that should come to your mind is uh, Etoday because it is designed to outshine. And uh, we, are, we, are, we are proud to say that our brand uh, really outshines other brands. And the reason it's called it today is because we do know that patients with pain, um, painful conditions, socioarthritis, guilty arthritis, uh, traumatic injuries like the one uh, Dr. Baraz just mentioned, in the morning they're likely to have uh, some pain. So the reason we call ours uh, it today is because we want them to rise and shine in the morning so that then they can have a great day. Uh, and that is why we call it the sunshine coxie. So our product is uh, uh, very potent in terms of pain management. Uh, we have the three strengths uh, of 60 mg, 90 mg, and 120 mg. And uh, the best, one of the best things about it coxib as a molecule is the fact that it's of course a COX-2 inhibitor, which definitely means a safety profile for your patients and uh, the other benefits that come with uh, being COX selective. Uh, but if you look at the data that we have, actually, uh, we've demonstrated that using etoricoxib 60 mg has a comparable efficacy to the clofenac 150 mg. And uh, most important about that is the fact that this will just be a once a day dosage uh, compared to the clofenac, which you'll have to use three times. And we do know definitely in medicine that the higher the pill burden, the lower the compliance and the poorer the treatment outcomes. So if you want to uh, treat your patients uh, adequately using the lowest uh, dosage that you can in terms of pill burden, then etorecoxib will be there uh, to meet that need. Of course, the once a day uh, administration is also very good uh, because of uh, adherence to the patient, like I mentioned. And uh, certainly uh, the victory of uh, the traditional NSAIDs comes in those two aspects, in terms of uh, efficacy, uh, in terms of um, uh, tolerability because of the gastrointestinal uh, friendly profile of the etoricoxib as well as uh, the once a day uh, dosage. So if you look at uh, etoday in comparison to the traditional NSAs like the clofena, you can see that uh, some of the trials we've done have actually shown faster pain relief in comparison to the clofena and uh, certainly uh, against the other coxibs like celecoxib. So if you're looking for efficacy, then uh, look no further. So our etoday comes in uh, three SKUs. We have 60 mg, uh, which is ideal for your uh, patients with uh, osteoarthritis. Uh, 90 mg is uh, mostly used for patients with uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis and other types of uh, pain. And uh, the, the 120 mg is usually for your acute pain, such as uh, uh, gouty arthritis and other traumatic pains that the patients might be suffering. And uh, the product comes in a very quality packaging, uh, what we call uh, alu alu packaging, where for those who are not uh, in, in the pharmaceutical sector, it means that the, the, the strip is basically made of aluminum on both sides. So that makes sure that the product is protected from light and sunshine, which preserves the integrity of the API, therefore delivering the best efficacy your, pa your patient will need. And if you needed any more reason to prescribe it today, then I just need to remember what I said about Sun Pharma. Uh, given the, the, the size uh, of the products we have, the pro product profile we have, and the quality standards we ensure across the world, then you can be sure that this works. The other product I will briefly want to mention is Max Galin, and uh, this is our Pregabalin. And I know for most of you, for patients that you treat for back pain, sometimes you'll have neuropathic pain. And uh, Pregabalin is exactly what those patients would need. And uh, science has actually shown that sometimes uh, it outdoes the traditional analgesics uh, for pain management of the back, especially where nerve pain is involved. Uh, the next slide actually talks about how uh, Max significantly improves the quality of life. So uh, in the country, we have Max Galin 75 mg, which is uh, available for your use. So anytime you need a pregabalin, uh, please think about uh, Max Galin. 
The last product I just want to mention briefly is Volini. And the reason I say briefly is because this is a household name. I mean, this is the world's number one topical analgesic gel. And if you have not tried it on your patients, uh, please uh, take advantage of, uh, of the fact that we have this product in the market. Uh, this is a product that, that has been in the market for long. And uh, given the efficacy and the price it comes with, uh, I can guarantee you it is the best bet on the table. Uh, one of the reasons why you should consider prescribing Volini is because of the quick onset of action, because you're talking about pain relief starting in two minutes. And this is thanks to the nanogel technology that the product is made with, which means that the product uh, quickly dissipates into the skin as soon as you apply it on the surface, uh, ensuring that there's deep penetration and uh, fast action, as well as effective pain relief from pain. Uh, if you compare with our competition out there, I can tell you the others don't have the nanotechnology we have, so which means that you are better off with Volini. The other reason you should prescribe Volini is because of the fact that this is a four-in-one. Uh, this is a one um, arsenal that has four ingredients that are, is going to uh, knock off all the pain. Uh, it's a declofenac-based gel, which means that uh, it comes with the efficacy of declofenac, it also has resimenthol, which absorbs, uh, helps to be uh, the clofenac to be absorbed properly and also increases the penetration. Uh, methyl salicylate is there to act as a counter irritant and also to reduce the perception of pain from the brain. It also comes uh, armored and fortified with uh, linseed oil, which is uh, both um, anti inflammatory and also to enhance skin permeation. I did mention the nanogel nano technology, which ensures that it's quickly absorbed. And the last and the best one is the emergel technology. So this basically means that uh, you don't need to massage Volini. You just need to apply it on the surface, and then it will be able to sink and steep and seep into the skin, and your patient will be experiencing pain relief within minutes. So the four-way action for first relief means that your patients are going to be relieved from pain, from swelling, as well as from infection. And just in case you're one of uh, those people who love the good old uh, meloxicam, we have not left you behind. We have our Movera, which is available in 7.5 and 15 mg strength. And uh, the price uh, and the quality that this product comes with means that it's the ideal choice for your patients. And as I close shop, uh, I just want to remind you that uh, everything you need for your pain relief is actually found under one roof. Uh, which is Sun Pharma. Uh, in our division, we have uh, everything you need for your patient who has gout, who has uh, acute pain, who has osteoarthritis in eto day, for your patient who has uh, trauma, uh, muscle sprains and uh, strains, uh, you have Volini. For your patient who needs uh, adequate pain relief from a tablet, uh, you, need, you have Movera. And then certainly for your patients with uh, neuropathic pain, you have Maxcare. So thank you so much for listening to me. I do hope that uh, all your patients are going to greatly benefit from the quality and uh, uh, efficacy that comes with our products. And I look forward to your support. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Atinga. I will bring the meeting back to you. Thank you. Uh, Stephen, thank you very much. Um, thank you for your very concise presentation and uh, for showcasing the products uh, you have on uh, display and in our market. Um, and yes, like we mentioned earlier, thanks again for the support uh, in the KOA program. Um, and with that, we'll now move on to the Q&A uh, session. Uh, I think firstly, um, like I mentioned, we, you're all welcome to send your questions via the chat or uh, uh, raising a hand and we'll get involved. Um, we have one from uh, Professor Gerko, um, uh, always an active member and uh, supporting uh, uh, surgeon to all uh, junior orthopedic uh, members in the society. Uh, the question is, is Jale, sorry, Mr. Baraza, is age a contraindication to surgery in children with a torn ACL? And what precautions do you take before and during the repair? 
uh, and where does uh, family history of fetal cell disease uh, feature in uh, your history taking uh, 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 approach? Thanks, uh, Prof. Uh, yes, thanks, Prof. Gaku. That those are two very uh, important points you've raised there. So. Starting with the first one about the age in ACL, no, no, the youngest one we did in uh, in fellowship was seven years old, seven year old ACL, and we reconstructed it uh, using the normal fashion. Of course, the thing that distinguishes children from adults is the fact that they grow, so they've got growth beats there. So you can't use your usual techniques of drilling. You have to get the image intensifier in and make sure that on the femoral side, your tunnel is not breaching the the, the distal femoral physis on the lateral side. Because what happens is that you'll get a tardy genu valgum. So in fact, after the operation, you follow them up with the early x-rays to make sure that they're not drifting out into valgus. That's the, it's it's the younger the child, the more technically difficult it is getting that tunnel not to cross the physis, but it's, uh, once you've done one or two, it's not it's not terribly challenging. It, you get better at it. Um, the other question was about hemophilia and sickle cell. Uh, absolutely. So hemophilia with bleeding in the knee, I have to say that I have not, much as I have read about it in the books and it's it's uh, mainly done it in exams, I have not yet touched wood, had a patient with hemophilia myself and I've not come across it, but it's a very important source of spontaneous bleeding within the knee. I think more commonly what we'll see is sickle cell, particularly in um, people from Western Kenya, the sickle, sickle cell disease is... is uh, a lot more prevalent here than other places I've worked in. And it's important to realize that because of the, the nature of the uh, erythrocytes, the patients can undergo necrosis, not just of the hip, which I think we are aware of, but also of the, the distal femur, the femoral condyle. So absolutely, that's something we should watch out for. I have to say, in uh, I've only read about the osteonecrosis of the knee in uh, sickle cell. I've not come across it. Most of the time, it's... It's in the hips, but it's a it's an excellent point in that we need to be aware of the uh, of the different pathologies that present in in diff in varying geographical locations. Thank you. Uh, so and just to follow on uh, from that, Mr. Barza, um and adding on to Prof. Gakou's uh, point is is the timing any different? to the adult scenario in terms of waiting for the knee to be cool or can you uh, reconstruct slash repair with reckless abandon uh, in the pediatric population? Um, no, it's so operating in a knee that's full of blood, which is normally what happens in the ACL as the middle geniculate artery is transected, you always risk arthrofibrosis. So granted, in children, they, they they can overcome the stiffness a lot quicker. But no, usually we wait a few months until the knee is cold and then we do it electively. So it's typically two to three months post-injury. And a lot of the time they don't, uh, it's interesting, they don't present like adults, you know, with a knee swelling injury because they, they injure it. They tell the parents they injured it. They hobble for some time and then they carry on trying to play. And it's only after repeated uh, subluxations are the investigations done? So usually, it's uh, by the time you get to them, it's you know it's about two months post the index, and then by the time they schedule them to the operation, it ends up being about three to four months post, which is ideal. We tell them not to engage in any pivoting sports because the danger, as I mentioned, is that constant subluxation which scuffs the cartilage. We want to avoid that as much as possible. So you want to get it done as soon as the knee is cold. So wait until the knee is cold, typically six weeks, and then reconstruct it, paying attention to the to the distal femoral physis or growth plate. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any other questions or comments uh, on the talk? Okay, uh, seems um, that's gone down well. 
uh, no controversy, um, silent green. Um, I'd just like to take this opportunity once again to thank uh, Mr. Barza for taking the time out to make that presentation, very informative, uh, and also uh, to thank our support, the support from Sun Pharma, and obviously most uh, importantly, uh, the KOA continuing uh, education program. Um, I think we can all be released now uh, and uh, looking forward to the next session. Uh, thank you all very much. Thank you.